We have just one case on this morning's docket. It's cause number 21-40166 uh, via Hartley Heen Gang Payne. Is the appellant ready to proceed? Appellee, ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. All right, appellant. May it please the court. Good morning, Your Honor. You can take your mask off. Oh, can I? May it please the court. Good morning, Your Honors. My name's He Chen, and I represent three appellants. All right, you're going to need to keep your voice up, please. Azum, He Gang Peng, and Che Haixia in this appeal. And I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. All right, noted. This is a trademark infringement case against numerous domestic and international e-commerce merchants across different online platforms, such as Amazon. I've got very old ears. You're going to have to speak louder. Such as Amazon, eBay, Alibaba, and Wish. Those are online platforms for selling merchants. I'd like to focus on two of the legal issues that are presented in this case. First is whether or not the Hague Service Convention procedure should be followed in this case. And that is the Convention on the Service Abroad of Judicial and Extrajudicial Documents in Civil or Commercial Matters. After- Let me ask you, right, the relief you're seeking is that we set aside the default judgment? Yes, Your Honor. Did you move in the lower court to set aside the default judgment? We did not. Is there a reason you didn't do that? We feel that this is, this type of litigation has become more and more prevalent in this country. And we feel that a clear decision from the circuit court may shed light to the district courts, whether or not service of process should be followed under the Hague Evidence Convention for international defendants. But there's nothing that would have prevented an appeal of a denial of the motion to set aside the default judgment in district court. Is that right? I mean, if you had filed a motion to set aside the default judgment in the district court, and the district court denied that motion, you would have been able to appeal that, wouldn't you? Still would be? No? I'm asking you. Yes. Wouldn't you be able to appeal that? Yes, of course. All right, so you just wanted to get here faster. Yes. And in doing that, you just, you denied the district court an opportunity to hear all these arguments you have as to why it should not have entered the default judgment. That- That's the result, but go ahead. Your Honor. Yes, so after the e-commerce merchants were joined together, procedurally, the biggest hurdle is to serve each one of the defendants properly, international defendants and domestic defendants. And there are different rules governing serving international defendants, which is a Hague Convention procedure. And the fifth- You've made an argument that this should have been misjoined, that the case was misjoined? Yes. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. I assume you would concede that if they could prove that all the defendants were essentially one entity or were working together, I assume you'd agree they could proceed joined in that setting. Your point is that these entities have nothing to do with each other? If they are proven to be an interrelated group of counterfeiters, then yes, I mean, that will destroy the misjoiner arguments. But does that answer your question? Right, so your point is that they haven't proven. They haven't proven, no. But they've alleged it. They did, without sufficient facts supporting their allegation. Okay, did you all ask for misjoinder in the district court? No. Were you aware of the pending proceedings? I realize you represent only three of the defendants, but I know that there were these emails sent to your clients. Were those the correct emails? That's 
I mean, that's one of the arguments uh, that I'm going to make. Uh, and uh, according to the three defendants that I represent, uh, the emails went to the junk box, so they never received proper service in this case. They went to the junk box. Okay, but, but those were your email addresses. They were. But those were the correct email addresses? They just they were, The yes. computer screwed up. Uh, yes, yes. So but, but, were correct email but the plaintiffs addresses. sent it to the right email they address. They did. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, I, was just, I wanted to hear the answer to, was that the correct email address? That was the correct email address. And, and, and that correct email address came from your clients. They provided that email address. They were provided to the online platforms, and then I think through discovery, online platform provided those email addresses to the, to the plaintiff appellee. And those were email addresses. Were email addresses to be used by anybody, any, any, any consumer, any customer, anybody who wanted to communicate with your clients? Were, I, could use that email address? I don't think that's public publicly disclosed. I think that email address is used for registration purpose. I don't know if that email address was displayed on those online uh, platforms. You don't know, so you can't say whether it was or was not the one that was available for the public to use. Available for public, I do not know. All right. But if I may go back to the joinder point. Um, you say that there's no evidence that the parties work together but wasn't the district court permitted to assume that you guys work together? Not, when I say you guys, you mean not just your clients, but all the defendants. Why can't the district court assume that they were working in concert as an interrelated group? I mean, the district court does have um, discretion in deciding this issue, but the thing is with improper service. Actually, does the district court even have the discretion? It's, it's been pled, but and it's not been disputed. I'm looking at paragraph six of the complaint. That, that, well, that is because no one raised the issue. And uh, the reason that no defendants came up with um, the argument is because a lot of them were not properly served. And without proper service, they were deprived a day in court, and they cannot read that issue if the service wasn't effectuated properly. Understood, but you're saying that this was an abuse of discretion by the district court. Um, Yes. Not, not, I'm, I'm not talking about service. We can, we can have a sure. discussion about service, but I'm talking about this theory that the district court abused its discretion in not severing these cases when, to my, from what I can tell, they had no choice but to accept the plaintiff's theory because they had nothing else to go on, and obviously plaintiffs didn't have a chance to do discovery. But the, there were alleged infringing evidence provided to the district court, and uh, mean, uh, in examination of those alleged infringing evidence can prove that there were different defendants selling different products with different um, product descriptions with different images, so clear. Yeah, but I thought I heard you just agree that if in fact the parties, that all the defendants were working together, then you couldn't misjoin, that, that this is a validly joined case. That's right. And so my point is, why is this not a frivolous argument given that the district court has nothing to go on other than the pleading? But there's a clear error that committed by the district court. If the evidence provided by plaintiff shows clearly that- That's a big if. I mean, the, the, at this point, there is no evidence. Plaintiffs haven't had the chance to do discovery. All there is is their, their pleading. Oh, there were infringing evidence provided with the complaint. No, no, but was there any evidence in the record that, that the defendants did not work together? But they did not work. It's proving together. negative, I realize, but. Right, 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 right. They did not work together. I mean, if you're the district court, what choice do you have? But if they're it's been the pled that they work together. Nobody's even denied it. For all, for all the district court would know, you would stipulate that you work together. It's just that it's totally legal. Well, but the district court can't act on its own discretion in deciding whether or not the evidence was supporting the claim. But the evidence provided by plaintiff simply do not support the claim. That. The or the pleading. All, all we're, at, we're at the pleading stage. Um, I assume you'd agree this case never proceeded to discovery. No. I mean, as far as I know, that no one. Did were, any defendant participate in the case? Uh, not the, those three def defendants. I don't know yeah. about the Pardon my ignorance. Did any of the other defendants, not your clients? There were other defendants involved uh, after the D4 judgment was entered. I don't know if there was any discovery um, ongoing with other defendants. Okay, but you are here asking us to find that the district court abused its discretion 
Uh, it sounds like you're saying that based on no evidence presented by any defendant to counter paragraph six of the complaint. Not by defendants, but by plaintiff itself. And uh, the district court. Right. By plaintiffs, it's. So by. You're saying the plaintiffs had evidence that they weren't working in concert? Yes. What was that evidence? The evidence that the uh, different defendants were selling different products. And uh, there's no common question law. Uh, there's no question or law of facts common to all those defendants. If they are selling different products and uh, the alleged um, infringement of trademarks was. When you say that they were selling different products, you mean just like literally they weren't manufactured by the same entity, but no, they, were, they, were, they were allegedly counterfeiting the same products, right, these, these two toys. That's right, the alleged counterfeiting. But the product itself doesn't look identical, I meaning some have uh, cut in certain parts. So Why does that prove that they weren't working together? Or, that, or indeed that they weren't the same entity? If they are working together, that they have to have there, there are companies that produce different products, Identical obviously. Products. Um, the alleged infringement is on the trademark, and some of them never use, don't even use uh, the, the trademark in their product description. So, <coughs> for example, one of the allegations is that the, uh, that the mark Green Flakes was, um, was infringed, but some of the alleged infringing evidence provided by plaintiff, um, they're simply, the seller were not even using Green Flakes as their product description. They use snowflakes, or they simply use um, Green Flakes as a descriptive term on their different brand names. And uh, if people are selling similar products on the different brand names, assume they are have their different branding, so assuming they're not uh, act in sort of participation with each other. May, Go ahead. I, may I proceed? Um, so back to the service issue. So the Fifth Circuit has consistently held that the procedure on the Hague Evidence Convention must be followed if uh, serving international defendants, if the address to the defendants are known to plaintiff. And uh, the district court in this case has recognized that plaintiffs should diligently attempt to locate defendants' physical addresses and, uh, execute, and, and execute, execute service on defendants in, in compliance with the Hague Evidence Convention procedure. And uh, the district court was correct in rejecting plaintiffs' first attempt um, to serve by email on um, May the 13th, 2019. And uh, so what changed from May 15, 2019 to June 17, 2020, when the district court granted plaintiff's motion to serve, uh, motion for service by email? Um, Leohart attempted to verify those addresses that it obtained from those online platforms by sending out FedEx notices to those addresses. And uh, later, Leohart claimed that those Actual physical address of the following defendants are unknown. And uh, Vilhart misled, misled the district court by claiming that none of the service or contact attempted by, uh, attempts were successful because the physical address were false. Uh, but this is not true. By their own admission, according to the FedEx del delivery status, there were FedEx mail that was delivered, there were uh, FedEx mail that was refused, and there were FedEx mail that was um, marked as incorrect address for different reasons. So those that were delivered and those that were uh, refused assume, uh, well, if they can be delivered or they can be rejected by the person who's supposed to receive the mail. At least that means those are deliverable addresses. And if the address is deliverable, that then they cannot claim the address is unknown to them. And if the address is known to plaintiff, then... Did, did Mr. Sorry, did he Gangpeng, uh, he gave an address to Amazon. I, I'm sorry, I assume it's a he, but I don't know. Uh, is it true that the, that the address that person provided to Amazon is this Red Oak, Texas address? That's... 
two according to the information provided by the has mr has this person ever resided in in red oak texas that i don't know and john i see my time's coming up may i finish my argument you may thank you um well, I don't, know about, I don't know how long that is. You may use up the rest of your time. You got 12 seconds. I have 12 seconds. Go um, ahead. So by plaintiff's appellee's own admission that, um, that half of the FedEx mail were deliverable, at least, um, so half of the address that they used, um, that they tried to deliver those mail to were deliverable addresses. Um, and, uh, if the address are deliverable, they are known to plan of <coughs> or the procedures on the, the Hague Service Convention should be followed. And uh, based on that, I am based on that, um, the entry of default should be reversed and uh, plaintiffs should have, defendants should, appellants should have their day in court and uh, um, bring uh, to present the, your argument on the, sub, sub, on the su subject matter um, of the trademark infringement. And so what would you say uh, if, if, and I, I don't know how this is going to come out, yeah. what would you say if there was, was an order of remand for a hearing on all these claims you're making about what was known and what wasn't known and who resided where and who didn't live where? Because um, it sounds like, you need a hearing in a district court, which is the place where evidentiary hearings typically occur, yet you're standing here. Uh, what would you say to a remand for that? To remand for? An evidentiary hearing on all these claims and defenses and all these other things. You, All the reasons you say the fault judgment should be set aside, reasons which just sound to me like they should be heard by a trial court. By trial court. Yes, Your Honor, and uh, the reason they were not heard by the trial court is because the motion for alternative service was granted and uh, service was um, done by email in this case. And uh, with improper service, not, some of the defendants were not served properly and uh, they never got a chance to read their argument in um, in the district court before the default judgment will enter. Thank well, you, Counsel. I, it seems to me that uh, that is what you would like because uh, just one judge, uh, it seems to me that uh, all that uh, you or your clients are seeking is to delay, delay, delay. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, the infringement uh, can't be heard from a standpoint of the merits. Uh, the merit can still be decided. I mean, if the or if irreparable harm can be proven for a plaintiff, if uh, they can show a substantial, if they can show a strong likelihood of winning on the merit, they can apply for a temporary restraining order and they can apply for a preliminary injunction order. So that, allow, that will allow the district court to decide on the merit before, um, before, before the procedure issue can be decided. Um, and uh, granting the temporary restraining order does not require, well, it does. Um, service is not. Does require service. Does require First service. You find exactly. You obviously and I don't want to be found. And I think this is the nature of international litigation. Uh, if you are suing foreign defendants, is they your are client willing to waive service if we remanded. The or I that I I don't know. I have to communicate. Okay, so there's defendants. we should not assume. For all we know, if it gets remanded, you're going to continue to protest service. But the service can proceed under the Hague Evidence Convention, uh, Service Convention. Um, if they can be found. If they can be found. I'm just trying to understand your position. So of course, basically, if it goes back, right. there's going to be continued litigation over whether you've been properly served. That's true, but the oral procedure uh, governing how a foreign defendant can be served. And then that'll be appealed. Excuse me? Whatever, whatever the ruling is will be appealed. 
so it goes on forever. You mean for the service decided by the district court? If we remand it and the district court rules eventually, as it must, uh, that will be appealed. But the district court decision on service is not immediately appealable, so the case had to proceed, and uh, the service can eventually be appealed again after the case is decided. Well, the Hague Convention, Service Convention doesn't apply when the uh, address is unknown. That's, that's right. So uh, what we've got is a foreign uh, uh, defendant and uh, a federal rule of civil procedure for F2 applies to that and we have a domestic defendant and 4E1 applies to that to use the Texas law 106P. So this thing ought to uh, go ahead. Uh, so the Hague Service Convention only applies to international defendants and uh, um, on the 4E, the district court can decide whether or not um, service by email can proceed under state law. Um, well, why don't, have your why don't been we served? just decide it? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Why, why don't we just decide it instead of sending it back to the district court and prolonging the ad infinitum? Um, Decide Meanwhile, on, uh, your clients continue to uh, do what the other side is complaining about, patent infringement or... A trademark infringement. Yeah, but, trademark. But, so the whole point is because of the improper service, defendants never get a chance to argue why their products, why, why their products do not infringe. Then waive service. Products. If you're so excited about this chance to defend, you waive service. Uh, but you'll get your day in court. Can can we can we do that? Yes. Oh, uh, sure. Oh. Thank you, Counsel. Great. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Wallace. May it please the court, email service is not prohibited by international agreement, including the Hague Convention. And in fact, it is the most efficient and reliable means of reaching foreign defendants who conduct infringing activities via online storefronts. This court has found that email service is not prohibited by international agreement, is within the district court's sound discretion to authorize, and comports with the due process clause. Email service is also, it reduces the significant burden that plaintiffs are facing in addressing the plague of foreign infringement on American intellectual property. Now, to serve any defendant, a plaintiff must first look to the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, which grants district courts broad discretion under Rule 4F3 to order alternative service by any means not prohibited by international agreement. Now, foreign defendants who set up online storefronts to peddle infringing merchandise, oftentimes using US-based platforms like Amazon and eBay, they commonly use pseudonyms and fake addresses if they provide any address at all to avoid service by traditional means. However, they must first provide an email address. And this email address is verified by the marketplaces. This email address is used to sign in. It's used to conduct business. It's used to communicate with all of the customers and with others. And it's used to actually send and receive money. They must use these email addresses, and as Appellant's counsel just said, all of these email addresses are correct. They were correct. This court and courts within this circuit have found that alternative service via email is not only permitted by the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, but it's preferable, for it's the most reliable, and in many cases, it's the only way that you can actually reach many of these defendants and properly and efficiently notice these would-be infringers that there's a lawsuit filed against them. 
And the Hague Convention is no obstacle to service via email on foreign defendants operating online storefronts. And in fact, in Nagrovision v. GoTech, this very court found that email service, court-ordered email service at the district level, is not, uh, is not prohibited by international agreement. And in fact, service under Rule 4F3 is proper and not prohibited. Now, this is because Article 10 of the Hague Convention preserves the ability of parties to effect service through specifically postal channels and through judicial officers, as long as the recipient nation has not objected to these means of service. In signing the convention, China expressly rejected Article 10. In so doing, it expressly rejected service through postal channels and through judicial officers. China did not object to service by electronic means. In short, an objection to Article 10 is not an objection to electronic service, including service by email. Because service by email is not prohibited by international agreement, district courts are free to exercise their very, very broad discretion under Rule 4F3, which the district court did in this case, to order alternative means of service on foreign defendants via electronic means. And as this court has previously held, the Hague Convention does not displace Rule 4F3. It's merely one of the many means that a plaintiff may serve a foreign defendant. Now, service via email comports with the due process clause as well, as this court has previously found, because foreign defendants who operate online infringing storefronts conduct business exclusively um, and extensively through their online stores and correspond with customers via email. Again, like appellants have conceded, those email addresses are valid, they are accurate, that is a very valid and in fact the best and most preferable means to reach these defendants. Because these email addresses must be valid to even commit the infringing acts in the first place, to set up the infringing stores, to actually sell these products, to communicate, to send and receive money, email service is the best and oftentimes the only way to actually apprise these defendants that there's a lawsuit filed against them. Do you know how defendants, th I'm sorry, these particular appellants, how they even found out about the default judgment? Because they, they said that the, uh, the original email went into a junk mail. How'd they find out that the district court entered judgment, uh, default judgment? There were many ways in this particular instance, Your Honor. Uh, we did try and serve the defendants that we could with the f physical email addresses that appeared to be actual physical email addresses via FedEx. We did get some bounce back. We got... Uh, I guess what I'm wondering is why are we even here in this appeal? The appellants obviously found out. These three particular entities found out about the default judgment. Do you know how they found out about it? They found out about the default judgment because they were noticed via email, Your Honor. So the email... Through these same email addresses? Through these email addresses, through email addresses um, to uh, any counsel who may have made themselves known. This is just... But they didn't have counsel. The, these three appellants did not have counsel, right? These three appellants, uh, correct, Your Honor. They were, they were noticed of this lawsuit through email, Your Honor, through the email addresses that were received through subpoena of the marketplaces like Amazon, eBay. So your theory is they got notice of the judgment, the default judgment at these email addresses, but they say they didn't get notice of service because that went to junk mail? It is... It's our understanding, because we do not monitor appellants' email addresses, it's our understanding <coughs> that the appellants were noticed of every step of this lawsuit through these email addresses, because they were apprised of the pendency of this lawsuit before the default judgment was entered, before the entry of default was entered, before any of the other motions filed in this matter were entered. They were noticed of these, of, of these proceedings as soon as the email addresses were received by the original plaintiff, appellee, uh, in the underlying case when that information was subpoenaed from the marketplaces. Can I switch to the joinder issue? Absolutely. Could the district court have sua sponte uh, found misjoinder of these defendants? Yes, Your Honor. The district court could have. However, the Fifth Circuit... In this particular... I don't mean theoretically. I mean, given what the, what the district court had in this case. Oh, given what the district court actually had before it... It could have, but it wouldn't have been proper, Your Honor, because all of the information... So it couldn't have. It shouldn't have. It shouldn't have. Absolutely not. That because of paragraph 6? Uh, exactly, Your Honor. What evidence was there, uh, if any, perhaps there was none, uh, in the trial before the district court on this issue of working in concert? What the plaintiff was seeing is that all of these defendants were selling these same counterfeit products 
these products that were touted as brain flakes they were branded as brain flakes products which as we know is the registered trademark of a pelly which is registered in two thousand and sixteen this mark's been registered for five years now it is a very very popular product many many sales worldwide and apparently some of those sales made its way to china and to other foreign jurisdictions where these products were very easily copied and counterfeited so here because we were seeing the same products bearing the same mark being sold at the same time supposedly within the exact same area then this does this does uh, these these series of transactions or occurrences do satisfy the fifth circuit's logically related test which it has adopted as espoused in mosley v general motors was there any evidence before the district court tending to, dis to disprove paragraph six that they weren't working together there's nothing before the district court your honor the defendants did not show up they did not defend the lawsuit they didn't bring any evidence whatsoever to prove that there was not some sort of series of transactions or occurrences or that the defendants were interrelated in some way in fact all of the facts pretty clearly show that these defendants were all acting in concert and in these sorts of situations pardon my ignorance uh there were 54 different defendants yes your honor did any of them appear in the case no your honor so all 54 you were not able to to serve none of them waived we, none we of them showed up in uh, plaintiff filed the motion for default judgment and it was not okay maybe i misheard i thought opposing counsel was saying that some of the other defendants had shown up but okay it, the, the motion for default judgment was not was not contested at all uh, but it applied to all 54 plaintiff, yes your honor, default against all 54 because none of them had been served uh, yes your honor or, uh, yes. You, you tried i understand but none of them had uh, had plaintiff, none of them had, 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 uh, had shown up to contest the case that's right your honor plaintiff was uh, alone at the hearing on motion for the for default judgment which was properly entered by the district court for the reasons stated and oh, i want to quote something from page 20 of the blue brief uh, it accuses your client of, let's see, it is against public interest to allow appellee, your client, to take advantage of the judicial system for personal gain. I want to give you a chance to respond. Absolutely. So there is no taking advantage of the judicial system for financial gain at all, Your Honor. In fact, the defendants are taking advantage of American consumers and American business people because here, they're not able to create their products and sell their products without the fear that there is going to be some sort of foreign infringement. And so here, plaintiff actually properly brought this lawsuit against all of these defendants because these defendants were properly joined. There was a series of transactions or occurrences that led to plaintiff bringing this lawsuit. And there's a question, uh, there's a common question of law common among all of these defendants as well, whether plaintiff's trademark was violated and the question is unequivocally yes here we have counterfeit products that look exactly like plaintiff's products using actually plaintiff's images and images of plaintiff's actual products to sell these infringing this infringing merchandise and so here they were they were properly joined the district court the district court properly did not sever these defendants from the underlying lawsuit and moreover the district court properly granted alternative service via email which it was able to do under Rule 4F3 because email service is not precluded by international agreement in any way. So therefore, plaintiff, Appali, did not abuse the judicial system by any means. In fact, plaintiff is only enforcing its own rights because its product, its trademark, its very valuable intellectual property was being used and abused by these pseudo-anonymous entities abroad who felt that they could evade service, who felt that they could avoid default judgment who could ignore a default judgment disappear potentially set up new infringing web stores and here we are here we are appealing. part of your response that it was the other side that was abusing the judicial system i believe the other side was judicing it was was abusing the, the judicial system for sure they were abusing uh many many years of american jurisprudence they they were not they were not honoring this court. They were not respecting the judicial system in any manner. And they in no way had any, had any intention to actually come and bring the facts before the court. We believe because they knew that they would lose, because this was a clear infringement, that there was clear trademark infringement, that it was clearly intentional as well. 
so yes judge we are yes for sure they were abusing the judicial system and for all of these reasons we do believe that the district court correctly found that email service was appropriate in this case and we're asking this court to follow its own precedent and rule that email service is not prohibited by international agreement by any means and that district courts do have broad authority to order email service pursuant to rule 4 f3 and in fact the any international service or any other means of service is not required before actually attempting email service in fact it's not even commonplace for a plaintiff located in the United States to be refined to be required to affect service of process on a foreign defendant in compliance with the Hague Convention or any international agreement courts in this ditch in this district have found that courts have frequently cited delays of service under the Hague Convention and also avoiding additional expense and trying to serve a defendant in a foreign company to also be reasons to go ahead and order that alternative service rather than making a plaintiff go through the months and months and potentially years trying to wait and see if maybe a country's central authority will in fact serve its citizens because in many instances that does happen and in most instances the central authority is never able to even find those defendants at all because as we've stated those defendants aren't really physical entities they're online entities they create an online presence at which they prefer to communicate with consumers and with others who are interested in their infringing products therefore email is really the only and seriously the best means of reaching these defendants in compliance with the due process clause and compliance with the federal rules of civil procedure and in line with precedent and so also just hitting on another minor topic there's policy and finality of judgments if the court were to sever the parties and direct the district court to take this case back up now that the appellants have actually chosen to show up and defend the lawsuit this would send a bad message to foreign defendants and it basically will mean we don't have to show up we don't have to appear we don't have to defend a lawsuit in the district court because we can always appeal it we can always show up later on we can see we can have the plaintiff show all of their cards we can show up on appeal we can say here we are now we are ready to actually defend this lawsuit and then it will be brought down and so that will set bad precedent it will undermine default judgments and it will prevent plaintiffs from enjoying finality in cases and so for all of these what would you have this court do I would have this court agree with its previous decision that email service is not prohibited by international agreement including the Hague Convention is in compliance with the due process clause and is the means most reasonably calculated and the most efficient and most reliable means to actually apprise defendants on an issue that are operating internationally where would this put the case back in district court or in Texas court or where if this case were to be remanded yes no what would you have us do I would have this circuit the Fifth Circuit follow its own precedent and rule that here within this circuit assume you want us to affirm the lower court yes your honor yes your honor yes affirm that email service is not prohibited it keeps going yes sir yes your honor and just affirm that email service is not prohibited by international agreement and this will give plaintiffs an actual means of meaningfully protecting and enforcing their intellectual property rather than some of these smaller plaintiffs who happen to have a successful and popular item from it will it will actually entice them to enforce their intellectual property otherwise I'm not sure if you if you heard judge we just follow up he said and then it keeps going referring to the case if we affirm this case is done isn't it that's correct your honor there is finality there's a there's a respect to the judicial process and the judicial system and it won't send that message to international defendants that we can wait we can sit on our hands let plaintiffs show all of their cards and then show up on appeal and continue to delay 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 because in that instance 
sometimes plaintiffs won't be able to continue to prosecute these sorts of lawsuits because in many instances there's no reason for us to remain and there's no reason at all your honor the appellant's did not show up at all at the district court appellant's counsel said that these email addresses were all valid all of these email addresses were emailed on multiple occasions of the various proceedings throughout the process and they didn't show up they didn't show up at the motion for default judging while the bogus items were being sold while while the bogus items were being sold and while funds were being drained from these accounts to frustrate plaintiffs eventual judgment that's why it is so so important that we affirm the district court's decision and moreover also rule specifically that email service is not prohibited by international agreement and is in compliance with the due process clause which will give plaintiffs a means of meaningfully enforcing their IP in the future and which will prevent these sorts of defendants from being noticed of a lawsuit draining their funds closing their stores and disappearing just out of curiosity on that point are you expecting hypothetically in the case of affirmance are you expecting to be able to enforce the money judgment or is this just about taking down from websites this is about enforcing our clients intellectual property your honor the money is certainly very helpful because these lawsuits are very very expensive and plaintiff does feel like there is a financial strain in enforcing judgment however I can be able to get the money or is this just telling Amazon I have a judgment please remove these products from your website it's about both sending message and the money your honor I wouldn't necessarily put one over the other there is like I said a financial strain but I think more importantly this is about the policy question are these products still on the webs right now then is that we as was the default judgment enough to we we don't think that they're there and in fact your your honor in many instances as soon as a lawsuit is filed these defendants close up shop they withdraw their money and they're nowhere to be found so it's it's in these sorts of situations in a an overwhelming majority of the defendants you can expect for them to be nowhere to be found for their for their online stores to be closed for their accounts to also be drained so therefore that's why we're asking you here today respectfully to uphold this circuits previous findings that email service is not prohibited by international agreement and that it could educate me a website like like Amazon only only requires an email address for their vendors when it comes to actually verifying the the address itself verifying the the web store they only need to verify the email address there is no verification procedures for the physical address Amazon doesn't confirm that it's a legitimate business at all there's no confirmation that there's a physical address a legitimate business is more of a nebulous term so it's difficult to say whether and I'm not trying to suggest anybody's oh sure legit or not I'm just asking hypothetically sure sure and so it's it's difficult to say whether Amazon actually vets its stores it's very very unlikely that they would do that and in 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 these sorts of situations because defendants are so fly by night they create these stores they shut down these stores they create new stores sometimes even with the same name just to have a different Amazon vendor number it becomes very very confusing and realistically that would not be a a valid way for Amazon to actually operate to spend a lot of its resources in vetting these stores and making sure that sounds like it's topic for Congress maybe but not for us sure it's a topic for Congress but also it's it's something for plaintiffs to police and plaintiffs won't police it if this court is unwilling to agree that email service is prohibited by international agreement because many plaintiffs won't be able to bring these sorts of lawsuits if they're not able to find these defendants if these defendants simply disappear also if plaintiffs are forced to file separate lawsuits against a multitude of different defendants it becomes unduly probative and costly because plaintiffs aren't able to to bring that many lawsuits and especially if we're in various different jurisdictions or many of the exact same lawsuit with maybe just some different facts thrown in for different defendants that would be a duly prohibitive and we would come out with different different decisions and all these various lawsuits as well and that would frustrate the judicial system too because plaintiffs wouldn't be able to cite to applicable authority because there would be conflicting views because different judges come to different views so here we respectfully asking that this court find email service is not prohibited by international agreement it is in compliance with the due process clause 
and a district court has broad discretion under Rule 4F3 to issue, to allow email service on foreign defendants without the plaintiff having to try and affect international service, including service through the Hague Convention, first. Thank you, counsel. Your time has expired. Thank you. Rebuttal. Thanks, Your Honors. I'd like to quickly address two points. The first is, this case is not foreign defendants versus U.S. IP holders. Let's don't forget there are domestic defendants involved in this case. So to that point, we shouldn't really draw a line between domestic defendants and international defendants, just because the— You're referring to some of the defendants other than the appellants? Is that what you're saying? Yes, yes. And so— I agree with you. You're saying the legal issues presented in this case affect lots of different— Affects lots of different defendants, and it's not— If I may, I'm just very quickly very curious. How did your clients find out about the default judgment? I think until the point that the assets in their Amazon account was transferred either directly to plaintiffs, appellees, or through other means. I see. In other words, once the default judgment was entered, Amazon started to— Started to process the transfer. Got it. Thank you. And just to rebut on one point, I think it's document number 34. One attorney for one of the domestic defendants did appear before the motion for default was filed with the court. So that means there were—so the process was effectuated before the motion for default was filed with the court. And that, to one extent, shows that the defendants cannot act in concert and participate— act in active concert or participation, because otherwise everyone would be notified regarding the service issue. And plaintiff and appellees very hard here alleged trademark infringement against three marks, not just one mark. And according to the evidence presented by plaintiff herself, it's very clear that no defendant infringed all three trademarks. So different defendants infringed on—allegedly infringed on different trademarks. So that also shows that there's no question of law or facts that are common to all defendants. And the second point I want to address— Well, the commonality would be that they infringed on a trademark of this plaintiff. Wouldn't that be common? You're saying there's no evidence that any single defendant infringed on all three trademarks, but they were all three trademarks of the plaintiff, right? Right. But I think Rule 20 requires at least— so to be a part of the same transaction requires a shared overlapping facts. So if they're not selling the same products and if the alleged infringed trademarks are different, that kind of destroys the argument that those two groups of defendants are interconnected because they are targeting this one trademark holder. They don't even—they probably don't even know that the two trademarks were held by the same person. And the other point I want to address is whether or not— You don't have to know who holds a trademark to infringe on it. All you need to know is you don't hold a trademark and you're using it. You mean for— You don't have to know who holds it. You mean for— What you need to know is that if you don't hold it, it's not yours to use. That's right, yeah. All right. But the point here is if the products are different, it's hard to imagine that they work together to infringe on different trademarks. So that destroys the argument of—so that proves the joinder is improper because there are different causes of action involved, although they are both—and there were cases that the court found 
allegations against multiple defendants, multiple but separate defendants of the acts, for the acts of infringing the same trademark or the same patents do not support a joinder under Rule 20, just simply because they are different defendants. Another point I'd like to address, I see the time coming up. May I finish the point? You may. It's related to the Rule 4F3, and that's related to a police argument that email service do not, is not prohibited by the Hague Evidence Convention. Well, Hague Evidence Convention actually do not talk about the email service. So the email service is really decided by individual signatory, individual countries that are members to the Hague, not Evidence Convention, Hague Service Convention, to the Hague Service Convention. So that's decided by the domestic rules of each country. So China have different set of rules, and the UK have different set of rules. And in this case, at least, the Chinese authority does not allow email address, email service for any judicial or extrajudicial documents involving service of process. So that is, so on the rule, so on the Article 10 of the Hague Service Convention, whether or not, so the objection to Article 10 proves that the Chinese authority has limited means of receiving judicial or extrajudicial documents through international judicial assistance. That means that they have to proceed with the proper procedure that prescribed under the Hague Service Convention. And just to tag on that, compliance with the Hague Service Convention is mandatory. And that is recognized by the Supreme Court in all cases to which the convention applies. And the Hague Service Convention was designed to simplify and to standardize serving process abroad by using certain approved method of service and preempts the inconsistent method of service. So in other words, it was designed to make sure foreign defendants was properly served and to safeguard due process that are afforded to foreign defendants under the Constitution. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Well, we'll take this matter under advisement. This concludes those matters which are on today's docket for oral argument. And we are adjourned.